Good afternoon and welcome to the inaugural talk in our Diverse Minds seminar series. I'm David Anderson. I'm the director of the Tian Shao and Chrissy Chen Institute for Neuroscience at Caltech. And it's really my pleasure and honor to be able to welcome and introduce Kafui Jiraza from uh, Duke University uh, as the inaugural speaker in this series, particularly during Black History Month. Uh, CAF, as uh, he likes to be called, is one of the most accomplished uh, and uh, committed um, uh, scientists in uh, and one of the country's leading voices in the fight against systemic racism in science. Um, I got to know CAF serving with him on an advisory committee to the director of the NIH for um, uh, uh, developing the second phase of the BRAIN initiative. Um, I wanna, before I get into uh, introducing CAF a little further, I just want to uh, say a couple of words about the origin of this Diverse Minds seminar series, because it's something that wouldn't have happened uh, without CAF's help. So after the uh, uh, events of the spring, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, and the town hall meetings that we have at Caltech, uh, it became apparent that there was a desire, particularly on the part of our underrepresented minority students and postdocs to hear more from outside speakers who look like they do. And as a uh, director of an institute at Caltech, uh, one can try to move forward on addressing some of these issues without having to get too bogged down in institute bureaucracy. And so uh, I called CAF to try to ask him for suggestions about the best way to uh, develop such a program and particularly how to strike the balance between uh, the outstanding science of the individuals that we invite to participate in the program and also uh, giving our community a chance uh, to learn something about their background and their personal journeys. So it was CAF who suggested the idea of having a sort of half-half presentation um, and that's what we're gonna do today. The first half of the presentation is going to be to hear uh, about calf science, um, particularly on the way that emotions are represented in the brain and their relationship to mental illness. Uh, and then we'll take questions uh, after that uh, science part and then proceed to a question and answer format uh, to let Calf tell us more about his personal journey and experiences and to answer questions, some of which I prepared and uh, questions that uh, I hope the audience will submit uh, as well. So let me just uh, talk a little bit uh, about uh, Kafui. Um, he is the K. Rangarama Krishna Associ uh, Endowed Associate Professor at Duke University with appointments in the departments of psychiatry, neurobiology, uh, and neurosurgery. And uh, he is the director there of the Laboratory for Neuroengineering. CAF is the first African-American to complete a PhD in neurobiology at Duke University. And he stayed on at Duke uh, to do a, 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 an MD and also to do postdoctoral work there as well. And he completed residence tra residency training in general psychiatry in 2016. CAF is a uh, internationally recognized figure. His lab was featured on CBS's 60 Minutes in 2011. He's received many awards, including the International Mental Health Research Organization Rising Star Award and the Sydney Bayer Prize for Schizophrenia Research. He's also received the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, which is the nation's highest award for scientists and engineers in the early stages of their independent careers in 2016. 
2019, CAF was awarded the Alan Leshner Public Engagement Fellowship from the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And he also received the Society for Neuroscience Young Investigator Award, which is an extremely prestigious prize that's given annually to the best young brain scientist in the world. In addition to carrying out first-rate research, uh, CAF has also been uh, extremely active uh, in, in uh, trying to lead the fight, as I said, against systemic racism in science. He has published important opinion and perspective pieces uh, in journals such as Cell. Uh, here are a couple of the titles uh, which I highly recommend uh, that you read if you have a chance. Um, CAF has uh, also previously spoken at Caltech uh, in the Chen Institute's inaugural symposium in 2019. So we're very lucky to have him here considering how busy he is. And uh, I just want to thank him for participating in this and to introduce him to give the scientific part of his talk, which is entitled Mapping the Structure of Emotions. Kaf, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me uh, here, David. And I really appreciate the opportunity to connect with uh, Caltech again. It's been it's an interesting two years to say uh, the least, but I'm glad we're all able to gather again. So I, it, interestingly, with the introduction, I gave a talk around advocacy and diversity earlier today. I had a suit on for that talk, but I figured, um, well, I'm in my own home and it's around seven o'clock here on the East Coast. So I've regressed back into my uh, typical <laughs> athletic wear. So thank you all for, uh, so much again for having me here. Um, as, as David mentioned, I am in the Department of Psychiatry and Biomedical Engineering and Neurobiology at Duke University. And um, if, if there are any comments or thoughts that you're not able to get through throughout the early part of the talk, um, on the research or on the second half during my personal journey, feel free to uh, shoot me comments on Twitter and I'll do my best to answer them at Kafwi Drasa. All right, so the talk today will be split into three parts. And these three parts, um, what I'm gonna try to do during these three parts is fuse the unique observations that I've had as a neurobiologist and engineer and as a psychiatrist to really think about how to achieve uh, an understanding of brain function and how emotions are coded, as well as to advance the potential for treatments for the most devastating psychiatric disorders like uh, depression and autism. So I'll start off uh, with a little bit of theory and I'll spend the first part of the talk here. And um, as David mentioned, uh, we were on the working group for the second half of the brain initiative. This is a federal initiative to understand the human brain. And I've really been wrestling uh, with this question around this word, which is causality. In other words, how is it that the brain does uh, what it does? How does it generate behavior, allows to move and actions? So what, what is the set of computations that the brain undertakes? And as I was getting ready to uh, join the brain work group, uh, I had a, a very fascinating conversation with a data scientist uh, colleague of mine. And I was telling him about the brain initiative, how we were generating all kinds of amazing tools to turn brain cells on and brain cells off, and that they would give us the ability to manipulate the system in ways that approximated physiology, such that we could ultimately figure out how the brain works. And this colleague of mine, the data scientist, he asked me a question that's really struck with stuck with me uh, since that time. And the question he asked was, well, that's interesting, Kaf. Uh, it's an interesting perspective on understanding causality in the brain. Surely you believe that the reason it's hotter in the summertime and cooler in the winter um, and tends to be warmer in the day and cooler at the night is because the earth is spinning on an axis and revolving around the sun. Now, I, I thought my friend was being somewhat facetious when they asked the question because obviously the answer um, is yes. And then my friend asked a second question, which will largely be the framing for this entire talk. And my friend said, well, why do you believe that if you've never manipulated the earth or the sun? And, and as I thought about that to some extent, it occurred to me that the reason I believe uh, that it is hotter in the summertime and cooler in the winter, um, and that it has a relationship between the earth and the sun is because people have observed the relationship between the sun and the earth over and over and over again for centuries and centuries and centuries. And by observing the system over and over again, um, they were ultimately able to figure out the relationship of the two that was related to temperature. 
And as additional fields of science developed, we were able to discover things like gravity and radiation and build these fundamental principles into our model of the relationship between the earth and the sun, such that we were ultimately led to conclude uh, that it's this relationship that drove temperature on the earth. And certainly there are um, alternative hypotheses uh, that might explain this relationship. One of my favorite cities in the world, I'd love to figure out how uh, I can ultimately get back, is <laughs> Amsterdam. And I love visiting during the summertime. It, uh, the sun sets around 11 o'clock at night, people are outside, they're happy, they're drinking wine. And um, it's warm and it's amazing. And I made the mistake of going to Amsterdam one time in the winter time and um, nobody was outside at all and it was dark and it was cold. And certainly one might make that observation and conclude that, well, the human body is about 98 degrees Fahrenheit. There's nobody outside. And so the reason it's colder is because there's nobody outside. And all one would need to do to invalidate that hypothesis of causality is go to the world in some place where it's really hot outside during the summertime, perhaps Dubai, um, in which uh, people aren't sitting outside in 120 degree weather all day long. And the idea here is that by repeatedly observing a system over and over again, I'm not making the argument that a correlation equals causality, but you cannot have causality if you don't have a correlation. And so we can observe a system over and over again, figure out of all the variables, which one of those things are not correlated such that we're only left with the variables that have to or are likely to explain what we're observing in a system. And this is the basis of a field. I'll talk about this um, to some extent in my talk is machine learning, just observing a system and many variables over and over again, such that we can figure out which of those variables can't possibly be correlated and therefore are not causal. All right, so I'll frame this talk um, loosely around uh, the neuropsychiatric illness, depression. I'm a psychiatrist. Um, I always like picking this illness because it's the most debilitating disorder in the world, according to the World Health Organization. So years of productivity loss it tends to happen to people in their early 20s. Um, it shows up in even folks, for example, that are in graduate school. And you can have one of the first two domain areas. You have to have one of the first two, so either depressed mood or diminished interest. And then you have to have increases and decreases in appetite, uh, sleeping too much or sleeping too little, psychomotor agitation, so moving too much or moving too little, fatigue or loss of energy, worthlessness or guilt, decreased ability to think or concentrate, and recurrent thoughts of death. And you have to have five out of these nine symptom domains. And um, what is particularly important um, around framing neuropsychiatric illnesses is that these symptoms have to lead to what we call social dysfunction or occupational dysfunction. In other words, it has to alter your ability to interact with the arena that you regularly move through. Now, here's the problem, right, with mapping emotions in the brain. You know, I'm, I'm always jealous of my colleagues that study things like reach uh, and intention. When we talk about neuropsychiatric illnesses or emotions in general, it's really hard to quantify uh, what mice are feeling. Right. So, you know, certainly I, I use this slide in jest. There's been some great work looking at facial expressions in mice and rats uh, by some uh, some of our colleagues in nice paper last year. But certainly it's the case that the things that I would see bringing people into the clinic, whether it's guilt or homicidality or suicidality, uh, we don't have great ways of modeling that in preclinical animal models. This is a major challenge in the field. And so I've been wrestling with some for some time thinking about how to map emotions in a brain when we lack the self report that we have in human studies. All right, now this is a, a study that was done. It was done by some colleagues at Duke, but has since been repeated in other labs as well that, I, that really gave some insight about how to tackle this question. So this is a functional magnetic resonance imaging study, our fMRI. And what they're actually doing here is they're taking advantage of the principle that when brain cells become activated, they use oxygen. And so functional magnetic resonance imaging is just looking at chunks of brain tissue and seeing how much oxygen is on the blood cell that the blood protein, uh, hemoglobin, that carries oxygen. So as your brain becomes more, uh, needs, becomes more activated, it needs oxygen. And so you can measure how much oxygen versus unoxygenated hemoglobin there is and chunks of large chunks of brain tissue across time. And so what they're gonna do in this study is that they're gonna bring in a bunch of healthy subjects. I never call them normal controls because they're Duke students, <laughs> but they, they bring in a, a bunch of uh, healthy subjects and they're gonna put them in a scanner. And then when they're in the scanner, 
they're going to show these students a series of movies. And these movies uh, have been shown to induce an emotional state. So they'll watch movies that make you happy, movies that make you sad, movies that might make you feel anger, movies that make you, might make you feel surprised as they're looking at uh, these students' brain activity. Then they, they take this brain activity and they use machine learning. In other words, they look at the patterns in their brain and they try to figure out what's the pattern of brain activity for sadness, happiness, anger. And then they bring the kids back the next day and then they put them in the scanner again and they tell them to, you know, don't think about anything, which every smart person is really bad at. So after about 20 minutes, they tap the students. And they say, well, what were you thinking about or what were you feeling? And the student gives a self-report. And then the question is, how much does what the algorithm or the machine learning model said you, you were feeling in terms of your brain function match what you reported you were feeling? And it turns out that they can do relatively well in classifying these states. And the reason I liked uh, this study so much is because it suggested that we can measure or quantify states um, in a brain without the need for self-report if we can learn uh, what it's supposed to look like. All right, so as I, as I build out the uh, theoretical framework uh, before I get into the neuroscience and, and the modeling, I'm an engineer, so I'm always gonna give you the assumptions that come out of the data we've observed. And the first assumption, uh, which uh, it's, it's a little bit hard to appreciate from the fMRI study, but it's, the first assumption is gonna be emotions are encoded at the seconds time scale. So emo the fMRI is giving you a picture of the brain, snapshots over seconds of time. So picture every, every second. And I, I think this is actually a really important Point. Much of how we think about our structure of how the brain operates, if it comes out of, you know, vision neuroscience or auditory neuroscience or even movement, you're looking at systems which are developed to process information on a really fast time scale, right? You certainly couldn't move your fingers or have dexterity if the system wasn't processing information at the same millisecond time scale. Um, you certainly wouldn't see objects uh, that are thrown at you if it wasn't processing information at a millisecond time scale. But here, um, we're going we're gonna to build a model where we treat a emotions at the seconds time scale instead of the millisecond time scale. And the idea there is that perhaps emotions are creating stable resonant states in the brain. And I always joke um, that I never had a patient come in, complain about being sad for a millisecond, right? So this is gonna be the first assumption of the model that we're gonna generate. All right, the, the second thing that's gonna go into building this model, I always like uh, this example, only the first year graduate school students and certainly the first year medical students know where I'm going with this. Um, but if I was about to put up a bunch of enzymes and substrates and um, you had a model organism and I, well, we could go through and figure out which of these enzymes and substrates can contribute to how much the model organism moves across an arena. And you might set up your experiment. You'd increase one and decrease one and measure how much the organism moves. And what you would realize at the end of this experiment is that all of them contribute to how much the organism moves because they're not independent, right? So they're part of the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle in which they work together um, to generate output. And the output is what we call orthogonal to the system. It's energy, right? So each of these independently contribute because they're all working together to generate uh, the output. Now, um, I use the term um, emergent property. Um, so I'll explain what that means. We'll move from the Krebs cycle um, to a neuron. I'm, I'm a terrible artist. So this is my example of a neuron <laughs> with the cell body and the axon and the terminals. And it's really hard to appreciate what an emergent property is by looking at a single neuron. But imagine um, if instead of looking at one neuron, I put four neurons together. All of a sudden, it's pretty clear what the emergent property of this is. Um, and it's seizure because the system keeps activating itself over and over and over again. Now, if I was to take those neurons um, and instead of moving the charge around this way, I change those neurons into a metal ring and move the charges around it. Again, you have an emergent property for all the physicists here um, and it is a magnetic field. And again, this magnetic field is orthogonal to the system that we are observing. So this idea of emergent properties is gonna be really important uh, because we're gonna treat emotions as an emergent property of brain cells working together. And here I say think sleep, right? Um, certainly sleep is not a single cell in cortex. It is a state in which many brain cells are working together, right? So that's what emotions, how we're going to create a model to deal with emotions. All right. So what we do in the lab is that we insert electrodes, each the size of a piece of hair into an animal's brain. And then we're able to record electricity from many brain sites simultaneously. And I'll talk about the types of data that we are able to extract out of the electricity. Here, I'm just showing you a CT scan, um, just showing you the electrode implant in blue, targeting multiple brain areas simultaneously. This is a rat. Um, we can co-register this on MRI to do our histology. But you can see the animals tolerate this well. And then we're able to record brain activity as the animal is awake and behaving. 
All right. The data that we get is electricity and we can low pass filter the electricity. In other words, we get the slower electrical activity. And this is represented as what uh, most people think of as brain waves. Um, if you're getting a scalp electrode measurement, it's sort of the same thing, except we're getting these from the tips of individual wires. So we'll call them local field potentials or LFPs. So we're getting local field potentials or electrical oscillations or brain waves from many brain areas simultaneously. And then we could do engineering analysis offline. We could take that brain wave, we can filter it into different frequencies and ask how much present of presence is there of these brain waves across different frequencies for each brain area. The second thing we can do is take advantage of engineering principles, which suggest that things that change together across time tend to lie within the same system. You can appreciate here that the peaks are lined up. Um, and so these brain waves from two different brain areas tend to synchronize. We call this LFP coherence or synchrony. Um, and it's just suggesting that these two brain waves are synchronized. In the fMRI world, this might be called functional connectivity, but this is happening on the time scale of milliseconds. In other words, these two brain areas are synchronizing. We can do engineering analysis offline in which we shift the oscillations relative to one another. And we ask if future act if activity in area one per predicts future activity in area two, then we say that that information is moving in that direction. We can infer um, information transfer, or we can shift the oscillations in the other direction and ask if information is moving from area uh, two back to area one. So this is the type of uh, quantification that we can get out of these electrical signals that we're recording from the brain. The second thing we can do is take the electricity and high pass filter it, and then we get the firing or the action potentials of individual cells. And What's really important, um, and I sort of uh, won't dig in too deep with the activity of single cells, but this point is really, really important, is that if you look at a local field potential, this is a brain wave, and I'm showing you a cell firing uh, that you can see across time from the same wire that's been planted in the animal's head, that this cell tends to fire at the peak of the brain wave. You can just see a histogram quantifying that behavior, the brain wave and the histogram of cell firing. Um, and this is called LFP, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, cross-frequency coupling and, or phase locking, excuse me. And you can appreciate um, here that therefore the firing of cells is represented by the phase of the oscillation. You can also see firing represented by the amplitude of the oscillation. And then finally, we published a feature in uh, 2016 showing that cell firing can also be represented by how two oscillations are synchronized with each other. So those features I just mentioned, uh, brain waves, amplitude, and frequency, and synchrony are all reflected by cell firing. At a minimum, they're capturing cell firing in the brain. So um, all uh, we need for the model is for one to believe the local field potentials reflect the activity of cells firing or populations of neurons. So local field potentials are an emergent feature of brain cells firing. And those are the three key principles to the model we're gonna to try to build. All right, so several years ago, um, I had been collecting massive amounts of data from many brain areas simultaneously. And I ran into a huge challenge figuring out how to analyze all of this data and build models with it. And Duke had launched a center called the Information Initiative at Duke. And it was headed up by a gentleman. His name was Rob Calderbank. And Rob was an interesting guy. Um, he made his career uh, a large part in telecommunications at ATT Bell Labs. And um, about a year after I talked to him, he would win uh, the Shannon Prize, which is the data science equivalent of a Nobel Prize. And as I was talking with Rob Calderbank, I basically gave him the exact same introduction uh, that I just gave you all about mental illness and the recordings we were doing. And um, Rob stops, he pauses for a minute, and he says, hmm, that's interesting. It's a lot like geothermal imaging. Now, clearly, I had explained neuroscience all wrong. <laughs> so I went through and I gave the introduction again. He said, no, 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 geothermal imaging. You basically have a planet, you have satellites going around a planet, you're trying to measure weather patterns, integrate them across satellites, and then zoom in and figure out what people are growing in the world so you could do prediction. And, and the more he described it, it occurred to me that perhaps the answers I was seeking uh, to understand how emotions were encoded in the brain and how these became dysfunctional in the context of men mental illness actually um, lay in other fields of science uh, that I needed to figure out how to gain access to. So Rob uh, said, he basically said, I have a guy, uh, his, his, his uh, colleague's name was Larry Karen. And before you knew it, I was on Larry Karen's uh, the thesis committee for his graduate students, Kyle uh, and David Carlson. And, um, I, I'm putting up here a picture. This is Kyle's uh, prelim 
committee document. And I remember opening up the document, I'm an engineer by training. And not only had I not um, seen most of the formulas in his uh, prelim document, I actually hadn't seen half the symbols in the formulas in his document. And it was quite an enlightening experience for me, right? Having spent 34 years in school, that I could very easily walk into different departments and I could be less informed than the first year freshman uh, <laughs> in that department as well. And, and to all the graduate students here, I'll say it was really important for me, um, particularly in my training of psychiatry, to learn how to be tolerate being uncomfortable with a topic such that I can learn more about it. So I hope um, by the end of this talk, I'll convince you that that was a useful experience for me of not knowing. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you what uh, we came up with together after you know, spending lunch uh, with David and Kyle for uh, almost a year straight and reading lots of supplemental material. All right, so this is the type of model that we're going to use. And we essentially decided that the model is going to have three layers. Um, the bottom layer, uh, we'll call that uh, the layer that belongs to the neuroscientists, right? And so what we're going to say is the bottom layer could be the things that I just described that we can observe. So what's going on in each brain area and what's going on in each brain area in each frequency. Then we can also observe how brain areas are synchronized, two brain areas are synchronized. So that's another type of observation. And then we can also figure out when things are synchronized, what's leading and what's lagging. So for each of the animals we're recording, we basically have you know, 5,000 things that observations that we can make on the variables. And we're tracking these, right? These are fast features in the oscillations. In other words, this is at the millisecond time scale. Then we're saying somehow the brain is gonna integrate these fast features into a slower time scale um, that we observe with regards to emotions, right? So we're gonna say the brain can generate networks where it can grab those fast features together into networks. So maybe um, those network one will be a sprinkle of observation one and observation 30. Network two will be some net, uh, observation two and maybe 45. Then we're gonna say the brain can generate emotional states, um, happiness, sadness, anger, and those are going to be combinations of networks, right? So the networks, maybe one and six will together make up happiness and two and 25 will make up something like anger. And what we're going to do with machine learning is we're going to learn the red lines and where they exist. And, and the, the best sort of analogy to think about this is a symphony, right? So when you hear music or sounds, sounds are really fast oscillations in the kilohertz range. So that's going to be the fast signals on the bottom. Somehow, um, when you hear a symphony, they've organized those sounds into chords, right? So those sounds are, are core, those chords are sounds played together. And then the conductor is co coordinating chords across instruments such that we have music, right? And certainly when we hear music, uh, it drives emotional experiences in all of us. And so while we're also learning the red lines, we can also across time figure out how loud each of the chords are represented or how loud each of the, the chords are, are being played. And we could track those across time. So that's what our model is going to learn, right? It's going to learn the fast features, the fast features that make up the networks at the second time scale, and then what is represented by the emotional states. All right. And I'm going to sort of switch into the neuroscience now. And we're gonna pick a very simple task. We pick the simple task because as I mentioned, uh, human psychiatric illness is characterized by social or occupational dysfunction. And since I'm not really sure what the occupation of a mouse is, um, particularly in the middle of a pandemic, we're gonna go with social dysfunction. So our subject mouse of choice, we're gonna be recording this to C57 mouse. And we're just gonna give it 10 minutes to explore an arena. And during that exploration, the mouse can spend time uh, with another really friendly mouse, basically exploring it um, and getting close to it. It's in a container so it can't escape, but the mice can basically sniff it through, you know, jail cell walls. Or on the other side, um, it's a new object. And the mouse basically has 10 minutes to move back and forth. We're recording electrical activity and we're video tracking it. And after those 10 minutes, we'll let the mouse, you know, hang out for two days back in its, its home cage. And then we're going to repeat the experiment two days later. And um, what we're going to do during each of those sessions uh, is we're going to randomize the location of the mouse and the object. So it sort of randomly flips back, new mouse, new object each time. And we're going to do that every Every other day for 10 days, right? So we have 10 minutes, 10 days, 100 minutes, or 600 seconds in which we've repeatedly observed 30 animals choosing between and running back and forth between these two options. And as you can see, mice prefer to spend much more time around the other mouse in green versus the object in red. This is a, a well-known feature. And we're doing this while we're recording brain activity. All right, so we're going to take the brain activity 
shove it through that algorithm or that model that I just showed you and see if we can learn a network. And for all the neuroscientists here, I'm just gonna orient you to this measure because I'm gonna use it over and over again. It's area under the curve of the receiver operating cur characteristic. Basically 0.5 means the network cannot tell the difference between two conditions. One means it can perfectly tell the difference between the two conditions uh, with it always thinking network activity is higher when it's in the social state versus the object. And zero meaning it perfect detection in the other direction, the object higher than the social. So we have a network and I'll show you how we got to this network on um, a couple of slides down. Um, this network can tell the difference between when the animal's interacting in the social condition or when it's interacting with the object condition. Here's uh, what the model looks like uh, for all the data scientists here that actually generates this network. We're simultaneously recording or measuring multiple LFPs chunked into one second bins. During those second bins, we're taking all the seconds where an animal's interacting on the social condition or the object condition. We're taking all of that into our input model, extracting power uh, and coherence and leading and lagging with Granger features. We have an encoder that learns the networks, and then we can simultaneously see how well our, uh, our neural networks that we learn can be recreated back into the original input data into the brain. Uh, while we're doing this, we're, si we're simultaneously uh, supervising it so we can figure out how well we detect um, social conditions or over object conditions. We're weighting the mice in the model, I'll explain why we do this on the next um, slide. And we're also uh, figuring out how well uh, we detect the social condition and we're weighing the animals. Um, for anyone who is not a data scientist, uh, fast forward through everything I just said. <laughs> What we're trying to achieve from a principled standpoint is that we're essentially saying a, mo a network that is going to be built to detect when a mouse enjoys social experiences should detect when the brain is uh, either social or not social, so social versus object. It should contain appetitive information. In other words, it's just chain uh, information about whether the mice likes something or doesn't. And then somehow it's got to take the social information, appetitive information, integrate them. And when it does that properly, it should be related to the individual behavior of the individual mouse. So the supervision gives us this part, the supervised weighting gives us this part. So this is what we're trying to solve. All right, this is what the network looks like. Um, and uh, I'll go like through this. We have a network freeze. Can you see the picture? I can see it. Uh, okay. Kath? Yep, can you hear me okay? Can you all hear me okay? I can hear you and I can see you, Kath. Okay, yes, all right, so, okay, so I think I'm okay. All right, so we are um, looking at the network here. This is the network that I've described. It is um, each of the brain areas that are represented. Um, VTA, amygdala, cingulate, hippocampus, infralimbic cortex, nucleus, accumbens, and prelimbic cortex. Um, if you see color, uh, any, any indication around the tire of the wheel, it means that brain area in that frequency contributes to the network. So cingulate at 10 hertz, hippocampus around 10 hertz, and at higher frequencies. And you basically see each brain area along the diagonal here. At the off diagonals, you see that um, that it's, it's brain, these brain areas synchronize that activity is part of the network, right? So this is a tone, this is a chord that's being played between brain areas. And that is represented by the spokes of the wheel. And then in red, we also can see when an area leads or when these two areas synchronizes, what leads and what lags. And so we have all of this information represented in this network. Um, this is just a summary picture of what I just showed you. I've color coded it. So you can see the information is organized in three frequency bands, uh, blue, the lower theta frequency, uh, four to 11 Hertz, um, and then a higher frequency activity in what we call the gamma range uh, represented by both the green and the red. Um, we also get information, as I mentioned, flowing through the circuit or the network um, based on what is leading and what is lagging. I'm just showing you a histogram here showing you how many areas each brain area leads. And this is showing where there's directed coherence. Um, in other words, information flow. I've summarized this here. There's only leading and lagging information in this frequency range. And this is a summary of how information is flowing through the network, um, originating or leading most in amygdala, prelimbic cortex and infralimbic cortex, relaying in cingulate cortex and nucleus accumbens, then through medial dorsal thalamus, and finally converging in VTA. So this is the structure of the network that we have just learned. And this network is activated when an animal is in a social condition over uh, when it is in an object condition. Now, importantly enough, um, I mentioned that we're also tracking these networks across time. So I'm gonna show you what the dynamics or the changes in this network look like. Um, this is an animal walking up 
and it either starts interacting with another mouse at this point or an object at this point. And you can see that the network actually detects um, that the social condition is more activity than the object condition. And this is when the network terminates an interaction. Uh, you can see again, it separates out the social condition versus the object condition. I've highlighted this in blue because it's supervised. So we are forcing it to learn a network that can tell the difference between these two. But the network has no information that it, for reason why it should be able to separate out before an animal starts interacting. So this time point here, and there's certainly no information um, that we put into the supervision that would uncover that the network slips down at the end of an interaction, overshoots, and then course corrects. So this is all dynamics that are coming out of this network um, that we've learned. And then finally, the last piece uh, that we've used for the supervision, as you can see, this is each individual mouse. On the x-axis, axis, I'm showing how much that particular animal chooses to socialize with another animal, the higher the social preference, the more that animal chooses to socialize. On the y-axis, I'm showing you how well its brain decodes the social and object condition. Again, 0.5 is no information, one is perfect information. And you can see that across the group of animals, the more they, their brain can separate out the social from an object condition, the more those mice choose to socialize. Um, we left this guy in anyways, because we don't really believe in throwing out outliers. Uh, and this is still statistics significant. All right, so one might ask, as I always ask the data scientists in my group when they give me really complicated answers, is, is this actually even necessary, right? Um, I'm a firm believer that the simplest thing we could do to get the answer is uh, the right thing. The brain is built uh, where it needs to conserve energy and resources, so it picks optimal solutions. So what I've done here is I'm just showing you um, first the decoding of the brain. I'm showing you the AUC here, and this is the performance of our network um, across the 30 animals. And then I've simultaneously gone through, and I just say if I pick parts of the network, in other words, oscillatory power in each of the eight brain regions, versus the strongest interactions, so the strongest sco spokes in the wheel uh, for a combination of areas. If I look at each of them independently, how good is coding, right? And so you can see that there's certainly information in parts of the network. In other words, there's information in the circuits that make up the network, for example, between prelimbic cortex and nucleus accumbens. But that information um, for each of the parts of the circuit is not anywhere near as efficient as the whole network together. So when you pull them together, they have more information uh, than when you look at each of them in independently. But I will point out if I was to do a scientific study or a paper, um, and I just had electrodes in two areas, I would get that there's information in this area. This would be statistically significant time. It's just there's more information in the broader network code. Now, when you look at individual behavior, so this is how well the individual social preference of each mouse is correlated with how well its own brain decodes. Um, and I'm just showing you negative log P here. So this is the significance threshold. I haven't corrected for multiple comparisons here. So um, this is uh, super liberal. It is only the network that encodes individual behavior. None of the circuit features independently reach the standard of encoding individual behavior. So behavior is a function of the network working together, not each of the individual elements. Okay, so th then the question is, how do we know we've got something right um, and that is good and that is useful? And so we use this standard set of criteria, uh, the same way I pointed out, you know, with the earth going around the sun, we came up with really cool fundamental principles like gravity and radiation. How do we know we're dealing with the fundamental principle when we observe uh, uh, this, this network feature. And so here are the three criteria that we're gonna set up. First, this network has to be able to decode social and object behavior in a new set of animals. Now, most of the time what people do in the literature is they take the same set of animals and they might use you know, the first seven days to learn the model and then the last three days to show that it generalizes. Here, we're gonna go a lot further where you wanna see that this network works in an entirely new set of animals um, that we're not used to create the model. Secondly, we're gonna show that this is linked to interpretable biology. In other words, it's linked to um, activity at a different level of analysis besides just the oscillations. And then finally, that this goes to new context. And I'll explain all of this um, on the next slide. And if we can achieve those three things, we have a fundamental principle. All right, here's my explanation for it. Uh, this is a uh, heart. Um, I'm a physician, so I, I think about <laughs> hearts and cardiology all the time. It turns out the heart um, has, like the brain, has cells that are able to move ions back and forth across the surface. The refractory period is a little bit different. It's longer, um, but still it's able to generate action potentials. And it turns out uh, if you were to start having chest pain and went in the emergency room, someone would put bleeds on your chest and they, were able to, they would record electrical activity through your heart. And by recording many leads, uh, 
uh, they would be able to come up with the standard picture of your heart. This is an electrocardiogram or an EKG. And what's really important about this EKG, why it's useful, is that people can interpret it even if the model wasn't created on you, right? So if we had to learn a new EKG uh, when you went into the emergency room, it wouldn't be super useful as a clinical therapeutic. But we know um, how to interpret information here because it does what's called generalization. And importantly, there are features um, in this EKG, whether it's the P waves or the QRS complexes, that we can relate to certain chambers or parts of your heart, whether it's the atria or the ventricle. So it's linked to interpretable biology. And that link allows us to predict how this would change when, if, for example, you had a heart attack. This is another example in which electrical activity is changed through your heart. It's uh, basically when there's an aberrant circuit in your heart that sends electrical activity round and round and round, Wolf Parkinson's white. Um, and we can link these changes um, with aberrant heart function as well. So this is what we're trying to achieve in terms of our network models. All right, so does this generalize to new mice? And here's what we're gonna do. So we're gonna plant a new group of animals with electrodes. We're gonna put them through our assay. Instead of learning a new network, we're just gonna push those um, electrical recordings into the network space we just learned. And then we're gonna say, how well does it predict behavior? And again, we're gonna test, um, does this in new animals, does this network encode social information? Uh, does it capture repetitive information? And then does it integrate these features such that it's, uh, it reflects individual behavior? And so this is a new group of animals, 28 mice. Um, I'm just showing you here, we've recorded them in the same assay. Again, green is a social encounter. This is when it starts. Red is when the animal walks up and starts an object encounter. And you can see that the dynamics here are almost identical to the dynamics in the original group of animals. The blue is missing here, the light blue, because it's supervised. So an animal walks up, it starts socially interacting, the network activity goes up, it stays up until the network activity, the social interaction is gonna terminate. Then the network activity slopes down, overshoots and course corrects. And again, Again, right before the social interaction or object interaction starts, the network can actually predict which of those two conditions the animal is entering into. So we show that this feature uh, in terms of the network encoding social information generalizes to a new group of animals. Importantly, um, uh, we also show that this works across sexes. So here I'm just showing you the social preference. This is male mice, this is female mice. This is how well their brain decodes. And this feature in which brain decoding is related to individual behavior uh, works, uh, the network retains its property in both male mice and female mice. So we can both detect social behavior and we can integrate, and this generalizes to an entirely new group of male and female mice that were not used to create the model. All right, um, secondly, we're gonna ask if we can link this to interpretable biology. I know there's some neuroscientists here, so I'm always sure to include this slide. Um, all I'm showing you here is uh, because we've got wires in the brain, we're simultaneously recording neurons, uh, single cells firing from all these brain areas. I'm just showing you in black here, a histogram. Uh, so this is a firing rate histogram of a cell firing across time. And on top of that, I've mapped on the activity of the network I just showed you across time. And we can find um, that cells in the brain show dynamics, in other words, changes in firing over time that match the dynamics of the network. We find instruments um, that's activity or the fingers of uh, the, the uh, musicians uh, correspond with the music that uh, we see being played um, and ooh, as we would expect. And it turns out about 20% of the cells that we record throughout the brain show activity that's coupled with the network. This is actually particularly important, um, confirming uh, what we were, uh, our basic assumption, which is that these networks involve multiple brain areas. So it's not surprising to see that there's cells in multiple brain areas that are showing activity coupled with the, the network. All right. So we can link this into interpretable biology. Finally, uh, can we go to new contexts? And this work is gonna be done, was done by Catherine Walder, uh, Alex Bay, who's a MD, PhD psychiatry resident in the lab, Lise Adamson, who's a graduate student, HHMI Gillian fellow, and Dalton Hughes, who's an MD, PhD student in the lab as well. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do uh, is we're gonna go to a slightly different social context. Um, here, we're gonna let our subject mouse of interest explore a new object, right? So the mouse is gonna explore a new object for five minutes. Then we're gonna put it in a new arena and it can interact with another mouse for five minutes. And then it's gonna go back and forth where it's exposed five times in each condition to a new mouse and a new object each of those five times, back and forth uh, oh, continuously. And then um, we wanted to know if the animal's brain can tell the difference between an object and a mouse. Because Alex had done so much work in looking at preclinical models of autism, she actually went through and did some fine uh, video scoring. And so we, are, we ended up getting our subject mouse when it was interacting with an object. 
Our subject mouse, when the two mice were ignoring each other, our subject mouse when it was being pursued by the other mouse and when the two mice were interacting with each other. And it turns out the network can actually detect not only the difference between social and object, but actually the difference between levels of social interaction, such that the network activity tended to ramp up as the uh, level of social interaction ramped up as well. The second thing we did uh, was we asked if this network had appetitive information. And so what we're going to do here is we're just going to take our mice, uh, this is a new group of implanted animals, and we're going to record their brain activity as the animals poke uh, in a box. And when they poke the wall, uh, they either get sugar or we come back the next day and give them water and back and forth. So they're either going to get sugar during a session or water during a session. And then we're just going to ask, how does the network, the social network that we learned, respond to poking for sugar or poking for water. And this is the water condition, this is the sugar condition. We can see that the network has a higher activity response to sugar over water. I'm just showing you decoding here as an animal walks up, it pokes for sugar um, versus water and the network detects the difference between sugar and water. Importantly, um, this network, unlike the network that was uh, social preference versus behavior, there's no relationship between sucrose preference and um, decoding in the brain. If anything, it's the animals that show um, the most sucrose preference that show the least amount of decoding in the brain, but this doesn't reach statistical significance. All right, and then finally, um, because this network can certainly encode um, other things besides social behavior or reward, it could simply just encode arousal that's happening across these conditions. Um, we use a standard test of arousal and anxiety that's used in the preclinical um, research. Uh, we've recorded a mouse in its home cage, and then we put it on an elevated plus maze, which is basically a ledge on a really, really, really high building. And the ledge, they're open lead parts of the ledge that you can see over to the floor way down uh, below you and there are closed arms uh, on the ledge of the building where you can't see and you're more protected. And mice tend to spend more time in this section of the maze because this one is thought to generate anxiety and mice that are more anxious um, avoid this part of the maze. So I'm just showing you network activity when an animal's in its home cage and then when we put it on the maze, uh, the maze which is anxiety provoking, there's no change in the network activity. Um, the network activity is only higher when the or lower when the animal's in the open arm. So importantly, this network isn't encoding arousal because the network is lower when the mice are more aroused. And the extent to which each animal shows anxiety related behavior is not related to the decoding um, that the social network is doing. All right. So again, uh, this shows that this network that we've discovered has social information in it. We've confirmed it in a group of animals. Um, this network has appetitive information in it. And interestingly enough, the network also has aversive information in it, but it is only the social and appetitive information that is integrated to modulate individual behavior, right? So these three features of our original network that we learned, we have demonstrated that they are, the, they are indeed there in a new group of animals, all right? So we can decode new animals. Uh, we can link it to interpretable biology and we can decode uh, new context. Uh, so ultimately, we think we have a fundamental principle of how activities organize in the brain. So one of my favorite shows growing up uh, was Price is Right, and I always loved how they had, you know, Bob Barker would go on and talk about the prize be behind the two doors, and then he'd ultimately say, but wait, and the audience would scream, there's more. So, but wait, <laughs> there's more that we can do with this. So we got really interested in this question. Well, we've learned a network. Uh, we can see how it is endogenously represented in the brain during behavior. Can we actually manipulate parts of this behavior and change activity in the network and behavior? So we decided to target a part of the pathway that some of our colleagues uh, had done some work around uh, in social behavior. This, this part of the pathway between prelimbic cortex and nucleus accumbens that they found to be important in social behavior. All right, and we're gonna use a set of tools called optogenetics. Um, this is uh, a quite uh, intuitive tool. Uh, it's the same type of strategy for why you can see. Uh, we, have, uh, we have proteins that can generate uh, light and change it to chemical and electrical activity. This is a channel on brain cells, so directly change changes light into current flow or electrical activity. And a set of scientists figure out how to express these on brain cells. So you can use blue light 
to cause brain cells to fire more. And we're gonna strategically in inject this channel in uh, prelimbic cortex, and then we're gonna turn on the connections of prelimbic cortex and nucleus accumbens. And when we do this, um, we're, you can see we're gonna do within subject controls. So the blue light, uh, we stimulate 10 Hertz. You can see the 10 Hertz signal show up in nucleus accumbens. You can also see back propagation. In other words, you can see activity going back into prelimbic cortex, uh, but you don't see any of this in other brain areas. Yellow light, which does not activate channel rhodopsin is our negative control. And in some of the animals that we implanted and stimulated, you can actually see not only the activity in our brain area of interest in the back propagation, you can see activity in other brain areas as well. Uh, you otherwise wouldn't know this if you didn't have electrodes here. We excluded all of these animals for an anal from our analysis because we couldn't make arguments about what was causing behavioral changes if that stimulation was causing other areas to be activated in uh, super physiological ways as well. All right, so here's what we see. Our, experimentally, we're gonna take our animals of interest, we're gonna put them in a, the object arena, then we're gonna put them in a social arena, they're gonna go back and forth in randomized order, uh, three object conditions, three social in, in, interactions within each of these conditions to get blue light or yellow light in randomized order. And then we're just gonna record their brain activity and see how different is their network activity between the object and the social condition. So this is what happens to brain activity and the object condition or when our subject mouse is being social with the other mouse in the yellow condition. Uh, when we stimulate with blue light, you can see basically the purple lines. Activity in our social network is higher during blue light stimulation than in yellow light stimulation across our subject animals. You see that by the slope of the purple lines. So indeed, blue light stimulation at this part of the network activates um, the network. Behaviorally, what we see is, um, I'll start with the object uh, interactions. Stimulation with blue light does nothing to the animal's uh, interest or time it spends interacting with an object. But when you stimulate with blue light, it increases the amount of time animals spend engaging in a social encounter. So we both activate the network and we drive social behavior. So this was an interesting uh, set of conclusions uh, for us because uh, during the previous study, they'd also stimulated this, um, they'd stimulated three basically projections or three connections uh, that were relevant for our circuit. The first one they stimulated was between prelimic cortex and amygdala, and they saw no differences in social behavior. And we're encouraged by that because this connection was not in our network. The second thing they stimulated was prelimic cortex and VTA. Uh, they saw no differences in social behavior there. And again, this was not in the network that we learned using machine learning. And then finally, they stimulated prelimic cortex and nucleus cummins. And interestingly enough, they actually saw a decrease in behavior compared to our increase in social behavior. And we wrestled with some time how to interpret uh, this, this differences in outcome. And it turns out... Um, the real difference is we stimulated 10 hertz, and that in that study, the stimulation was 20 hertz. And the reason why this is particularly important is because if you look at the architecture or the endogenous uh, construction of the network, it turns out that the network information or network is organized at 10 hertz. So if you're stimulating at a high frequency, you're actually disrupting um, activity in the network, or at least that's our hypothesis, versus 10 hertz, which increases the activity in the network. So we tested this directly, um, and we just directly compared stimulating uh, with 10 hertz hertz or with 20 hertz, and it turns out it's indeed the case. If you stimulate with 20 hertz, you are suppressing the network compared to 10 hertz, um, and it suppresses the activity in the network irrespective of state, but it only suppresses so so social behavior because you only need the network for social behavior. It has no effect on object behavior whatsoever. So what this suggests is that stimulation is actually a key, key, key part of encoding emotions in the brain, the stimulation frequency. It's not simply location. It is actually the frequency of stimulation in terms of interpreting how what sort of code is in these brain areas. Okay. And so I'll, I'll end here on these last like uh, three or four slides uh, with another but wait, uh, there's more. Because my lab is really interested in demonstrating the relevance of these features in these networks for thinking about illness, like I showed you with the slide of the electrocardiogram, all right? And so we decided to do a quick test on a, uh, a m animal model of a disorder that's been associated with dysfunctional coding of emotional behavior. And uh, this model is going to be of autism spectral disorder, a uh, spectrum disorder, which is associated with social deficits, repetitive behavior, and communication deficits. And we're going to take a gene mutation uh, that has been uh, shown to be a high confidence 
wrist gene uh, for autism, uh, gene uh, Encrin 2 that encodes a protein called Encrin B. And the reason why this gene mutation, um, we picked it, is because unlike many of the animal models that are used to model autism, which call what's called syndromic autism, um, in other words, autism that profoundly impairs cognitive function, uh, some normal thoughts as well as social behavior. Um, these animals uh, or these humans with this mutation have high intelligence, um, normal to high intelligence with their social behavior as well. And so we're taking a, a gene mutation that was identified in a patient and recapitulating that in mouse. This work was done by Catherine Walter. She created the mouse in Ben Bennett's lab before moving to my lab. And uh, the way these mice are generated, you just take a heterozygote male, we cross it with a female, uh, we get the pups and the pups are both uh, normal and heterozygotes, right? So we just wanna basically compare the function um, of the network in these two animals. And a really important point here that I think is often lost in the preclinical world, uh, we put these animals through our social preference task and on the task, they have normal social preference, all right? So uh, one has to wrestle with the idea. These are great genetic uh, models of autism, but they don't show the behavior that people classically think of in autism. And, you know, I, I, I always, I make the point here that, you know, having spent time in an autism clinic, that we often think of autism as a, a disease in which those with autism have no interest in social interactions whatsoever. However, but, but certainly there are those uh, with high functioning autism who one would describe as being socially awkward, but they have a high interest in socially interacting. So in any case, we observe uh, that these animals show what we would call normal social preference. But when we look at them, uh, they're, they're decoding in their brain. What we ultimately realize is that these are the wild type animals, again, uh, individual behavior versus network activity. And you can see the relationship across individual mice that the stronger the coding is in the individual individual mice, the higher its social preference. This relationship is gone in uh, the mutant animals, um, such that the activity in the network is no longer related to individual preference. And we think this is particularly important. Um, it suggests that likely at some type of developmental time point, the brain learned to use a different set of circuits to construct the representation of social information and appetitive information. And we're doing some follow-up studies now to look um, to make sure that there is indeed appetitive information in the construction of this network. Again, uh, the activity is above 0.5, so there is social information here. It's just not related to individual behavior. All right, so this is ultimately what we see in our genetic model of autism. And I think it's really important for thinking about how to model um, human uh, neuropsychiatric illnesses and animal models and what the right measure is. Sometimes it's not always what we would think of as simple behaviors. All right, and then I'll end here uh, with the, the last bit of data uh, because um, as I've learned, you certainly should never trust uh, just one animal model of a human psychiatric illness. Uh, so we took advantage of uh, animal model for autism based on stress exposure. And what you do here um, is you have your normal animals. Uh, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna stress the animals during the preterm period, right? So before birth. So we take the mothers in the first trimester and we expose them to an environmental pollutant, uh, in this case, diesel emission particle, which has been associated with increased incidence of autism. And then in the third trimester, we're gonna take away the bedding from the mother, which stresses it out. And when you have both of these manipulations, um, you have uh, the pups uh, that grow up. And interestingly enough, uh, when the pups are young, the male animals show social deficits, the female animals don't. Um, when you wait for them to become fully adult, again, the female animals don't show social deficits, but the male animals actually show an increase in social preference, right? So at the younger age, they show decreased social preference, and at older age, they show increased social preference, but there's certainly something that is uh, dysfunctional, it's not normal. All right, and then I'll walk you through this final slide. Um, I'll start off uh, with the normal animals. In the male animals, you see the same sort of relationship between uh, social preference, so individual behavior in terms of how much that animal chooses to socialize as well as decoding in the network, again, above 0.5. You see that relationship that I mentioned in female animals. Um, and in the female animals that had the pre-term pre, uh, pre manipulation, you can see that this relationship is still intact. It's only in the male animals uh, that this relationship is disrupted. Coding in the network is disrupted, and it's, it's disrupted in the same way, actually, that we saw in the Encrin 2 use. Okay, so um, 
in, fi- in, in, in summary, uh, we, we wanted to see if our network generalized. Uh, we can show that it decodes new animals, not simply new trials, but new animals. We can link it to interpretable biology. This is the self-firing. We can show that this decodes new contexts, both in the sucrose uh, reward task, as well as different types of social behavior. And finally, we can show uh, that we can manipulate this um, and see predictable changes in outcomes of the network as well. So we think we have what we would call an explainable network. So we're now going through in the lab and we're making multiple networks. We're trying to learn networks for anxiety, social behavior, aggression, negative valence, um, and anticipation, each of reward anticipation, each of those different levels of development. And what we're, we're trying to achieve in this is to go back and actually try to solve the problem that I originally uh, put up uh, about decoding of emotions in animals. And our idea is that we can actually solve it this way. By learning a series of networks um, and learning the dynamics of those networks, we can quantify emotional states um, in animals. And we now have a set of tools where we can quantify uh, several networks. We can extract them in real time. And they're the basis of a set of tools for closed loop emotional state stimulation devices that uh, we're piloting and developing in the lab. All right, uh, final slide. Uh, and um, this is the acknowledgments. I've, I've sort of given people their props as uh, the experiments I've shown them throughout the talk. This is my lab. I always say, um, it's important to appreciate uh, my lab looks like America. Uh, several people are missing here. I'm super proud of Rainbow Haltman. She's now uh, just started her lab at Iowa uh, and was recently awarded the new innovator, uh, NIH New Innovator Award. It's one of the most competitive awards for young scientists. Uh, but my lab looks like America, right? And I think that we've always appreciated that a diversity of experiences and perspectives is critical for doing integrated team science. And um, I hope I've shown you today that the type of questions uh, that I think are really impactful and important for human health uh, will require a lot of different disciplines coming together to solve them. So thanks again uh, for having me here and I'm happy to turn it back over to David to uh, coordinate questions.